Chapter Eight: Common Courtship Practices. The ideas of courtship have their foundation in erroneous ideas concerning marriage. They follow impulse and blind passion. The courtship is carried on in a spirit of flirtation. The parties frequently violate the rules of modesty and reserve and are guilty of indiscretion if they do not break the law of God. The high, noble, lofty design of God in the institution of marriage is not discerned. Therefore, the purest affections of the heart, the noblest traits of character, are not developed. Not one word should be spoken, not one action performed. That you would not be willing, the holy angels should look upon, and register in the books of heaven. You should have an eye single to the glory of God. The heart should have only pure, sanctified affection, worthy of the followers of Jesus Christ, exalted in its nature, and more heavenly than earthly. Anything different from this is debasing, degrading in courtship. And marriage cannot be holy and honorable in the sight of a pure and holy God, unless it is after the exalted scriptural principle. The youth trust altogether too much to impulse. They should not give themselves away too easily, nor be captivated too readily by the winning exterior of the lover. Courtship, as carried on in this age, is a scheme of deception and hypocrisy. With which the enemy of souls has far more to do than the Lord. Good common sense is needed here, if anywhere. But the fact is, it has little to do in the matter. The habit of sitting up late at night is customary, but it is not pleasing to God. Even if you are both Christians, these untimely hours injure health. Unfit the mind for the next day's duties, and have an appearance of evil, my brother. I hope you will have self-respect enough to shun this form of courtship. If you have an eye single to the glory of God, you will move with deliberate caution. You will not suffer love-sick sentimentalism to so blind your vision that you cannot discern the high claims that God has upon you as a Christian. Satan's angels are keeping watch with those who devote a large share of the night to courting. Could they have their eyes open? They would see an angel making a record of their words and acts. The laws of health and modesty are violated. It would be more appropriate to let some of the hours of courtship before marriage run through the married life. But as a general thing. Marriage ends all the devotion manifested during the days of courtship. These hours of midnight dissipation, in this age of depravity, frequently lead to the ruin of both parties thus engaged. Satan exalts, and God is dishonored when men and women dishonor themselves. The good name of honor is sacrificed under the spell of this infatuation. And the marriage of such persons cannot be solemnized under the approval of God. They are married because passion moved them, and when the novelty of the affair is over, they will begin to realize what they have done. Satan knows just what elements he has to deal with, and he displays his infernal wisdom in various devices to entrap souls. To their ruin, he watches every step that is taken, and makes many suggestions. And often these suggestions are followed, rather than the counsel of God's word. This finely woven, dangerous net is skillfully prepared to entangle the young and unwary. It may often be disguised under the covering of a light. But those who become its victims pierce themselves through with many sorrows. As the result, we see wrecks of humanity everywhere. 
To trifle with hearts is a crime of no small magnitude in the sight of a holy God. And yet, some will show preference for young ladies, call out their affections, then go their way and forget all about the words they have spoken and their effect. A new face attracts them and they repeat the same words, devote to another the same attentions. This disposition will reveal itself in the married life. The marriage relation does not always make the fickle mind firm, the wavering steadfast and true to principle. They tire of constancy, and unholy thoughts will manifest themselves in unholy actions. How essential it is, then, that the youth so gird up the loins of their mind and guard their conduct that Satan cannot beguile them from the path of uprightness. A young man who enjoys the society and wins the friendship of a young lady unbeknown to her parents does not act a noble Christian part toward her or toward her parents. Through secret communications and meetings, he may gain an influence over her mind, but in so doing he fails to manifest that nobility and integrity of soul which every child of God will possess. In order to accomplish their ends, they act a part that is not frank and open and according to the Bible standard, and prove themselves untrue to those who love them, and try to be faithful guardians over them. Marriages contracted under such influences are not according to the word of God. He who would lead a daughter away from duty, who would confuse her ideas of God's plain and positive commands to obey and honor her parents, is not one who would be true to the marriage obligations. Thou shalt not steal was written by the finger of God upon the tables of stone. Yet how much underhand stealing of affections is practiced and excused. A deceptive courtship is maintained. Private communications are kept up until the affections of one who is inexperienced and knows not whereunto these things may grow are in a measure withdrawn from her parents and placed upon him who shows by the very course he pursues that he is unworthy of her love. The Bible condemns every species of dishonesty. This underhand way in which courtships and marriages are carried on is the cause of a great amount of misery the full extent of which is known only to God. On this rock thousands have made shipwreck of their souls. Professed Christians whose lives are marked with integrity and who seem sensible upon every other subject make fearful mistakes here. They manifest a set, determined will that reason cannot change. They become so fascinated with human feelings and impulses that they have no desire to search the Bible and come into close relationship with God. When one commandment of the Decalogue is broken, the downward steps are almost certain. When once the barriers of female modesty are removed, the basis licentiousness does not appear exceeding sinful, alas, what terrible results of woman's influence for evil may be witnessed in the world today. Through the allurements of strange women, thousands are incarcerated in prison cells, many take their own lives, and many cut short the lives of others. How true the words of inspiration, her feet go down to death. Her steps take hold on hell. Beacons of warning are placed on every side in the pathway of life to prevent men from approaching 
the dangerous forbidden ground. But notwithstanding this, multitudes choose the fatal path, contrary to the dictates of reason, regardless of God's law and in defiance of his vengeance. Those who would preserve physical health, a vigorous intellect, and sound morals must flee youthful lusts. Those who will put forth zealous and decided efforts to check the wickedness that lifts its bold, presumptuous head in our midst are hated and maligned by all wrongdoers, but they will be honored and recompensed of God. You must not imperil your souls by sowing wild oats. You cannot afford to be careless in regard to the companions you choose. A little time spent in sowing your wild oats, dear young friends, will produce a crop that will embitter your whole life. An hour of thoughtlessness, once yielding to temptation, may turn the whole current of your life in the wrong direction. You can have but one youth. Make that useful. When once you have passed over the ground, you can never return to rectify your mistakes. He who refuses to connect with God and puts himself in the way of temptation will surely fall. God is testing every youth. Many have excused their carelessness and irreverence because of the wrong example given them by more experienced professors. But this should not deter any from right doing. In the day of final accounts, you will plead no such excuses as you plead now.